A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this 69th edition of the Together for Education webinars brought to you by Noto. Months ago, back in April 2020, we were just in the first phase of lockdown. It seemed like something that would last a few weeks, probably a month or so. There was this urgent need to have our educators used to new learning platforms. Zoom was quickly becoming prominent. And we said, let's have a series of webinars, maybe 12, where teachers could log in, use Zoom, share their thoughts and ideas about what was going on in the pandemic situation. Well, today when I say, welcome to the 69th edition, it fills me, fills me with immense joy and pride that we have been able to conduct these programs, thanks to your love and support, week after week. A few weeks back, I believe it was one of the panelists who said that Wednesdays and Saturdays are now notebook days. And we have been extremely proud to have been able to create a platform where eminent educators, thought leaders, and other dignitaries have been able to share their thoughts. We at Notebook are an edtech platform. We create short, crisp videos pertaining to the school curriculum. This works in two ways. One, the teacher has access to these videos in their classrooms, whether it's online or offline. Those teachers can play these short videos as an introduction to the lesson that they are about to teach, which helps them engage the students better. The second way in which this works is months later, when the students have to revise a particular topic, they refer to these same videos on their personal devices, smartphones, laptops, whatever they have. They don't need to buy additional hardware for it. And then using these videos, they can revise those topics. And because these videos were used during the class, it helps them remember what was taught that particular day. We at Notebook have been proud to serve more than 2 million students till date. And thanks to your support, we hope to keep growing. Today is a very special day, 23rd of January, the birth date of Netaji Shubhas Chandra Bose, one of the eminent leaders of the freedom movement. Which is why today we decided to do something very special. I will come to that special thing in just a bit. But today we are talk, going to talk about being patriotic and what patriotism means in the parlance of education. Before we start our sessions for the day, let me play a short video, a short sample of one of the notebook videos, which talks about how the feeling of nationalism rose in India. The first railway line was laid from Bombay to Thane in 1853. Initially, the Indians were very dissatisfied when the railways were introduced. They expected separate coaches reserved for them based on their castes and religions. However, this did not happen and they felt this was deliberately done by the British to defile their religious purity. However, as Indians started travelling together on these trains, they started interacting with each other. They soon realised that their problems may have been different, but all of them were suffering from a common evil, that of the British government. The Britishers had always portrayed Indians as barbarians and defended themselves by saying that they had colonised India to civilise its people. Soon, several scholars and religious reformers started writing articles in which they emphasized the past glory and the rich heritage of India. They wrote about the golden age of the Guptas, Mauryas and the Mughals, emphasizing that they had a rich syncretic history, culture and tradition which had been destroyed by the coming of the British. The Asiatic Society of Bengal and scholars such as Max Muller, Monier Williams, Henry Thomas Colbrook, Mahadev Govind Ranade, Hari Prasad Shastri, R. G. Bhandarkar and Rajendra Lal Mitra studied and published ancient Indian literature. They revealed to the people of India the brilliance of the Sanskrit language. They also inculcated in them a feeling of pride for their past and faith in their future. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was just a short clip from one of the more than 10,000 notebook videos that help students learn various aspects of their syllabus. Moving on to our speaking session. The first railway line was late. Our first speaker today is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious Doon School in Dehradun after 44 years of serving in education. He served the Doon School as housemaster, 
Head of Department, Dean of Activities, Dean of Student Welfare, Deputy Headmaster, Second Master, and Acting Headmaster with great distinction. He also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the US. He qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College UK in the year 2000. He is also an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist. Sir, privileged to have you with us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Shubayo. I hope I am audible and visible enough. Perfectly, sir. And a, and, a, and a very good evening to Achin, you, Shubayo, Abhishek, our entire notebook team, and our guests and our panelists, Dr. Manekar, General Ganguri, and, um, and all those who have tuned in. Um, when I look at uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, and I was reading about him, I cannot fully understand him without also at the same time considering Gandhi, because they have so many similarities to begin with. Both these gentlemen were freedom fighters, patriots, loyalists, who wanted the yoke of British rule removed. These men were driven with a burning passion to the extent that they sacrificed their domestic lives, families, friends, languished in jails, but tortured only because, because of their burning love for, for the country. As they saw India, a free nation, and hence their aims were similar. Both trained as lawyers in England, and could have followed an affluent, comfortable lifestyle had they chosen to. Both were well off, but they spurned that comfortable life for one of suffering, endless restlessness, frustration, but being non-conformist, you know, it's not an easy thing. Development, I think, depends more on non-conformist than conformist. And yet, as teachers, we want our children to conform which is what the British wanted us to do. But their means were not similar. Gandhi stuck to his own non-violence and he had the patience to wait, to be disobedient. And, uh, and the British were fed up with his disobedience, his relentless efforts and his stubbornness. Subhash Chandra Bose on the other hand was impetuous and impatient. And after a split with Gandhi on ideological grounds, he pursued a completely different path a path slightly more violent with more aggression. Yet the lives of these men made, they, the lives of both these men could have made a fantastic plot for a movie in Hindi, um, as you know, like two brothers who turned out so different, yet they had a similar aim. Myself, I mean, talking about myself, I mean, being a Christian, I identify more with Gandhi being the pacifist and the one who could turn the other cheek. But there are times when I feel that we are too tolerant as a people and take too much apathy and inefficiency and nepotism. And sometimes our kindness is taken for weakness. That's the time when I want to be more like Subhash Chandra Bose. I want to be more active, more decisive, little more aggressive. In the end, one was revered and acquired godlike status, the Mahatma, while the other was termed the warrior and aggressor. And yet both of them were, were so important for India. Now, how does, this, how does this relate to our lives today? Yes, we live in a secular, democratic, multiracial uh, racial nation, struggling with a large population, yet forging ahead in so many ways. But the fruits of our economic progress somehow fail to reach the poorest and the marginalized of our country. We have had enough of Gandhi tolerance, Nehruvian diplomacy. And now I think we need more the Subhash Chandra Bosch-like aggression as we have lost patience with what is happening and the rate of progress. The recent number of riots, the protests, the agitations, and the people's movement just go to show how, how unhappy people are as a whole with the current situation, whether it's pollution or water shortages, crimes against women, you know, uh, alleged suicides by an actor. You know, people are raising their voices now. The recent standoff with China in Ladakh, the recent spate of uh, riots following the gas bill, uh, or the situation in JNK. You know, the nation has been more decisive now, and been strong, like Bose would have liked it to be. Um, like I said earlier, uh, we need to act. And I believe that India has shown resolve and acted on all these fronts just 
as it has been decisive in bringing out the new educational policy. While tolerance has its time and place, we also need to bear our teeth sometimes when needed. As a nation, we are fond of blaming politicians and the government for its failures and wrong decisions and mock at the quality of our average politicians, many of whom have criminal records. But how many parents would want their children to join politics? Why not return from their US education and serve the country like Bose and Gandhi did? Can they give up their life of comfort, their lives as bankers on Wall Street or doctors in Los Angeles? It is the boys and girls from the schools that I have known and I have visited and I have taught in this middle-class clientele who've had a holistic education. These are the people who should become politicians. It is the team sports, the sense of fair play, the values of honesty, integrity, humility, and community service that these schools teach that would put them above most of the bunch. Now, I know that at the Dune School, many boys uh, <clears throat> have entered politics and are still there. Uh, they're also honest journalists, writers, social workers, entrepreneurs, doctors, economists who are serving the country and fighting the corrupt systems. They're speaking out against all forms of wrong. It is the Hush Mandars, the Pranoy Roys, the Amartya Sens, the Ramchandra Guhas, the Faye D'Souza's, and thousands of unknowns who are faceless who are coming from our type of schools, who are making that change. How many of us teachers and teachers listening into this talk, talk to their classes and encourage, you know, and, uh, and, and uh, encourage this, this free, um, uh, to free India from all sorts of oppressions and tormentors like boasted. When will our children after the education they receive stand up and speak for freedom safety for women, the gay rights, food for the poor, and the plight of the farmers on the Delhi borders at the moment. The responsibility that comes from the benefit of a good education is enormous. One can take the easy road to safety and comfort, or one can take the tough road that Subhash Chandra Bose took. The enemy is not always across our borders. It can be lurking within our borders, like sectarian politics, casteism, the VIP culture that sons of the rich and famous flaunt, religious intolerance. And we as teachers need to talk to our children about taking action and not just being passive bystanders. We need to produce more Subhash Chandra Boses. Now, the question I ask is, are children born patriotic or can they acquire a sense of patriotism? Now, at the Dune School, where I was very fortunate to be for 33 years, there was a very subtle message that all students imbibed. It wasn't taught, but they picked it up by walking the corridors and by living in this 85 year old campus. And where did it start from? Let me tell you that our early headmasters came from Eton and Harrow. They, and also our Indian head uh, teachers came from Shanti Niketan. In fact, Mr. Foote, who was our first headmaster, was actually very closely watched by the British because he was an Indophile and a freedom sympathizer. And he sent Pandit Nehru books while he was in jail in Dehradun from the school library. Um, the school song, as I mentioned in some webinars before, was sung in 1935 as the school song, which became the national anthem that Tagore wrote. Our school song became the national anthem. And there's a plaque that hangs in our foyer, written by the first headmaster, Mr. Foote, which says that the students of the school belong to an aristocracy, but it's not an aristocracy of wealth and position and privilege, but an aristocracy of service inspired by selflessness. And boys pass these, this plaque many times a day for six years of their lives. There is subliminal learning that is taking place. The school rests on four pillars, egalitarianism, democracy, secularism, and service. And all boys are treated equally. You can come from a five-star culture. You can be a scholar who's getting a free ship. You all sleep on the same hard bed. It's a very frugal lifestyle, very austere. <clears throat> 
there was a story once where Pandit Nehru uh, came to the gates. This was way back when he was prime minister because his grandsons were in school. And the then headmaster, Mr. Martin, was in the carpentry class working with some boys cutting wood. And the guards phoned and said um, to Martin that Pandit Saab Agya. And Mr. Martin picked up the old black telephone and uh, spoke to the Prime Minister of India and said, um, Mr. Nehru, if you are here uh, as the Prime Minister of India, then I'm coming to see you straight away and we'll have a cup of tea. But if you are here as the grandparent of your grandsons, then you should have taken permission from the housemaster just as other parents uh, would have done. And that is what, that's, that's the way we treat, the, the school treated people equally. He had come as a grandparent. Uh, and so I think he had to go home. Um, uh, <clears throat> in 1947, there were just 300 boys in school. Uh, 50 to 60 were Muslims, 15 to 20 were Sikh, 15 to 20 were Parsis, six to eight were Christians, and the remaining two thirds were Hindus. And in the Second World War, 65 of our students went and served in the armed forces. Democracy was a very, is a very, very big thing in school. It is not spoken about, we live it. We have societies and committees and councils for everything. The boys run the school. They are stakeholders, whether it's a journalistic policy, stage committee, library councils, mess committee, the boys run the school in a democratic way. We never order students around, we explain to them. They cannot be easily convinced, uh, like I see in some other schools. Now, we cannot preach democracy and equality and then order and push children around. We need to teach them to stand up for their rights because sometimes strong-willed adults build weak-willed children. And what we want is somebody strong-willed like Subhash Chandra Bose. The school was established by a set of Indian lawyers working in the UK, meant for Indian boys, not British expatriates, Indian boys, but along the best public school uh, systems that they found in England on a, meritocrat on a meritocratic, uh, on, on meritocratic lines. And <clears throat> so that what, we'd what these boys imbibe is that they had to stand up and be counted. Eventually, these boys were going to serve a free and meritocratic India. Many of them, as I said, joined the armed forces, the ICS. In fact, we had the first uh, Rhodes Scholar and the first ICS officer who then became the chairman of the board. We had politicians like Karan Singh, Manishankaraya, the Gandhis, Jyoti Aditya Sindhya, Jatinder Prashad, Pillu Modi, CPN Singh, Dinesh Singh, Kalike Singh Dio, and even Naveen Patnaik. Kamal Nath, Amrinder Singh, Dushyan Singh, Arun Singh. And why? Even the Pakistani General Gulam Jalani Khan was a Doon school boy. And let me tell you, after, the, after partition, many of the Pakistani boys who studied in school went across and opened a brother's school called the Chan Bagh School just outside Lahore. And up to about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we used to have a very, very healthy exchange, a sporting exchange between Chan Bagh School in, pa in Pakistan and the Doom School. <clears throat> now, a lot of our students, a lot of our old boys uh, went on to becoming uh, government servants, plenty of ambassadors, diplomats, industries, Bajaj, Hero Honda, Maruti, Royal Enfield, Aisha, Max Hospitals, the Thapa Group, the Murgapan Group, Escorts, Fortis, they're all run by Doon School boys. Journalists, Pranoy Roy, Indrajit Badwar, Arun Puri, that's of the India Today Group, Vikram Chandra, Prem Shankar Jha, Swaminathan Aya, Karan Thapa, George Vargis, all serving the country. Why, even Peter Mukherjee was a Doon School boy. So what I say is not, not all of us turn out well, but they try. We have people, actors, Ali Fazal is doing well. Roshan Seth, who played Nehru in the film Gandhi, was a Doon School boy, lived the same life as everybody else. And Anish Kapoor, the great sculptor, whose huge monolithic work 
stood outside the 9th, 2012 London Olympics. Now, the other thing that we did was before UP broke, broken up into Uttarakhand and the, and the UP, we had government scholars. We had two government free ships who came to school every year. So we had about 12 to 15 government free scholars. These boys came from villages in UP. They couldn't speak English and they were accepted by boys of rich families. They rubbed shoulders with the rich and famous. And we learned so much from these kids. They were a breath of fresh air. We also take in boys from all over country. I think, I think they're just two states currently where, which are not represented in the Dune School. This national integration and understanding built this brotherhood that exists. There was no talk about color and creed differences or caste differences. We lived the egalitarian life where we staff members ate the same food as the boys. And we learned that we should not bend our knees towards insolent might. We should never fear the strong and we should never oppress the weak. Each one of us, as the prayer said, must learn to get on with his own destiny, unfettered and free. The school prayers and hymns are taken from Kabir, Tagore, St. Francis of Assisi, Kalidas, Chisti, Rumi, Mother Teresa, Iqbal, even Gandhi's favorite hymn has been recently added before I left school. We respect all festivals, all holy days. And on Gandhi Jayanti every year, we have a very, very large sit down lunch where every boy and every staff member serves all those people who work for the school from the ground malis to all the, the carpenters and the welders and everyone who serves school. We have a panchayat ghar and our students teach the children of all the workers in our school. This is all a way of serving, of serving the country. Our community service is very strong. We serve the poor and it's not just tokenism. It's real grassroots. We, we adopt slum schools, we feed the poor and even our alumni are very hard at work. In fact, there was a group of kid, uh, students who were serving free lunches outside All India Institute of Medical Sciences not long ago, came in the papers. We rush to any disaster, whether it's earthquakes, Latur, floods, tsunamis, Burj, Orissa, Uttarakhand, our teachers and boys and old boys are always the first to get there. We take on social, ecological and political issues. Our boys marched the streets of Uttarakhand when we were um, speaking about freedom from UP. When the state was formed, the Dune School boy was at the forefront holding his flags and asking for statehood. We, our boys led marches in town with teachers and we shut down the limestone mines that were destroying the hills and scarring the, the hill faces near Missouri. We green the valley, we, we grow trees, we paper recycle in school, we are a paperless school, there's vermiculture, there's no litter. The litter on campus is used to create compost. Now, while hanging pictures of patriots and raising flags twice a year um, are good, it's not enough. I think our responsibility as educators is to, well, is to develop patriotic service-oriented students who will eventually believe that they are privileged and they have to give back to the nation whatever each one of us has to give. Each one of us has to listen to the stirrings of our innermost recesses of our, of our beings, which we call the heart, and see what is it that we can give. Just like the Gandhis and the Boses listened to that little voice that urged them to come out of that comfort zone and come back to India and serve the country. I think I, I've, said, I've spoken enough. I am now going to hand this over to Shubhayu. Many thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that wonderful, wonderful speech. In fact, uh, while we are very, very proud to have set up this webinar platform, I think today is a day I lament this being a webinar and not a real seminar because you're missing out on a standing ovation. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, 
Ochin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. He is a fellow of the ICAI and a member of CPA Australia. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. Ochin is an avid reader and a passionate traveler with keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce, and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Ochin, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Shubhaya, am I audible? Yeah, Ochin, loud and clear. I once again welcome all of you to today's session on a topic the very mention of which makes our chest swell with pride as citizens of this great nation which has stood tall for thousands of years against invading forces who have time and again conquered parts of our land but have never ever been able to conquer our hearts and alter our culture. The sinister design of all evil forces have always been defeated in terms of their pursuit for cultural invasion. Today, when I look at this topic, and a topic as dear, as close to all of our hearts as patriotism, especially on this auspicious day today, I was looking at it from various perspectives. I was looking at it from a backdrop perspective. Then I was looking at exactly how to differentiate between nationalism and patriotism. I was also looking at the current scenario that the pandemic has unveiled and how the spirit of patriotism has really helped in terms of all stakeholders coming together and joining hands and ensuring that we were smoothly passed through the entire crisis. Now, to start with, looking at things and taking a glimpse at history, turn, trying to turn a few pages and looking at some important incidents and events. In 1608, during the reign of Mughal Emperor Jahangir, the first ship of East India Company named Hector with William Hawkins as its captain arrived at the Surat port on the coast of Gujarat. Now the Portuguese had already arrived in India a century and a decade earlier. But it was the British who eventually dominated the history of India. For nearly 150 years, the East India Company concentrated on trade and commerce carrying Indian manufactured goods and spices to Europe and making huge profits, making a fortune by their sale in England and other European countries. Now, meanwhile, the gradual collapse of Mughal Emperor, emergence of regional rulers and mutual rivalries drew the East India Company in the vortex of power struggle in India. The French who arrived in India during the later part of 17th century became trade and political rivals of the British, who eventually lost their race to the British in a bid to establish political power over India. The British military success, and uh, especially in the Battle of Palasi against the Nawab of Bengal, marked the beginning of the imperial ambition of the East India Company. Under successive governors, General British Territorial expansion was achieved with ruthless efficiency. If you look at major victories during that period, victories against Tipu Sultan of Mysore, victories against Marathas, and finally the conquest of Sindh and the subjugation of Sikhs led to the political domin domination of the East India Company. Over the entire, entire subcontinent, in some regions, the British imposed indirect rule over the native rulers. Now, the rule of East India Company for over a century actually adversely affected practically every section of the Indian society. The revolt of 1857 
although it failed in its primary purpose of driving the British from India, it succeeded in putting an end to the company's rule in India. As Queen Victoria, in her famous proclamation of 1858, transferred power from East India Company to the British Crown. The Second World War proved to be a catalyst in India's freedom struggle. As the war was at its height, the Japanese forces were fast advancing in Southeast Asia towards Burma and India. And in August 1942, the father of the nation gave a call to the British to quit India and leave the country in the hands of God. The Quit India movement was widespread, leading to British brutality and death of thousands of freedom fighters. Now, as the freedom struggle reached its penultimate stage, British realized the futility of holding on to their Indian position and made a number of proposals to various diplomatic missions to chalk out the program of final transfer of power to the Indian hands after the end of the war. Post-independence, if we go through Pandit Nehru's drastic destiny speech in the Constituent Assembly, it really sums up the pain that the country had undergone and the hope for the future of a new nation. So when we discuss this, and when we discuss this in the backdrop of Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose's birthday that we are celebrating today, we understand the contribution of this great man and the kind of pressure, the kind of impact he had in the entire scheme of things. During Second World War, the fact that British made various gestures, reached out to diplomatic channels, trying and looking at practically transferring power. We understand the kind of influence he had in the scheme of things. Undoubtedly, his martyrdom and his role in leading the Indian National Army from outside India are one of the most glorious chapters in the history of India's freedom struggle. So today, when we take a more objective look and we really try to understand what patriotism is all about, So my take on this is that there is obviously a contradiction between nationalism and internationalism. And yet they prevail together, right? National, national chauvinism at home and international globalization abroad. Similarly, if you look at terms like nationalism and patriotism, nationalism as devotion to one's country easily becomes exclusive. You know, my country first, right or wrong. When national interests clash with those of others, at times, nationalism becomes antagonistic and hostile to other countries and results in violence and war on the world stage, rather than dialogue and tolerance, leading to a compromise for the greater common good and peace. Now, such a chauvinist nationalism thrives on finding on creating national enemies, whether within outside the country. However, we look at patriotism as a concept, as a non-exclusive love of one's country, must be premised on self-confidence and openness to other countries without fear and suspicion. Definitely, it's a far better term and more constructive for an inclusive society. Things like trade and finance, facilitated by media and migration results in an imploding globalizing world. For instance, for instance, the consequent rapid and radical change brings back uprooted people who seek lost roots in localization. So when you look at patriotism per se, definitely is a far more viable basis for a national community in pursuit of the common good. Now, today, when we look at this term, we cannot also ignore the positive view of nationalism as a constructive force, an ideology that builds a, builds a nation state, organize a community of people more efficiently and purposefully, promotes cohesion of democratic institution values, and a negative view, negative school of thought, which tries to differentiate between nationalism and 
patriotism. Now, the positive view is on the acknowledgement that nationalism has driven many successful independence movements, including the Greek and Irish revolution, both against imperial powers, the Zionist movement that created modern Israel, dissolution of Soviet Union, which permitted the reaccession of earlier nationalism, long stifled in the collective enterprise of Soviet communism. Negative points like Nazis, Italian fascists are things that we look at. But having said that, we all understand that when the French overthrew their king with shouts of liberty, equality, and fraternity, and proclaimed their declaration of rights of men and of the citizen, they were asserting a slogan and a set of principles that they believed to be valid, not only for themselves, the French people, but for all people everywhere. So these are basic premises on which patriotism is based. Love for one's country, love for culture. And it has been, and history has proved time and again that as a nation, we have, we have practically withstood each and every culture and invasion. And this is something which is really unique in the world. In spite of centuries of rule by British, earlier Mughals, we have never lost our culture as a nation. And I guess that's the most incredible thing, culture and traditions. When you look at things from today's perspective, what the pandemic has done, last few months, you know, an, an invisible virus, which has locked down the whole country and generated an unprecedented fear and panic that we have not seen since partition. Now, a realization has also set in that real threat to the country today is not only in its borders, of course, it's a huge threat, but threat also lies right here in the air we breathe the land we touch, and a new set of heroes and warriors have emerged. So today, if you look at every village and town, those engaged in the battle in over the last few months, selfless service, doctors, nurses, paramedicals, scientists, researchers, sanitation staff, pharmacists, no, they're real patriots risking their own life and their family's life in order to keep all of us safe. To me, their sacrifice is also unparalleled patriotism, which you should realize and recognize. Others too, for instance, those who are fighting a war to prevent our economy from collapsing, those who ensure supply chain of goods and services on which our daily living depends. Humble entities, people who Many, many, many stakeholders take for granted. Store clerks, the neighborhood grocer, the truck driver, the vegetable vendor, the milkman, the delivery boy, the bus conductor, the journalist, who ensure the news reaches us every day, even during pandemic, the private security guard who kept all of us safe. And let's not also forget the back room. You know, invisible invisible people working in the back room who keep our telecom sector running, who keep internet systems running. So whatever we have done last few months, online classes, digital infrastructure, definitely a lot of people are working in the background who kept us connected. So undoubtedly, they enable families to stay in touch. They help us access vital information. Now, these techies, they may not be risking their lives, but they ensure that our digital civilization does not collapse. So to me, these people, they are also real patriots. And if there's one important lesson that this pandemic has taught us, it is that these unsung heroes, unacknowledged professionals are also our soldiers for the future. It has hopefully taught us that whereas boots on the ground will always be needed, the next millennium also belongs to biological, economic, and cyber warfare. Protecting our borders will always be most important. We have a highly, and 
that we have, we have the highest regard for armed forces because that that is always very very important. But the challenge also lies in protecting our ways of life, natural environment, health of communities, and our real enemy today will be our inability to accept that the world will change irrevocably after this pandemic, and that we may need to relook at our definition of patriotism. What is also needed is to recognize the new these new warriors. and we need to realign our national resources so that these patriots are better equipped to defend our ancient civilization our culture and our modern economy so i guess this pandemic has really ensured in fact our esteemed educators in this forum who ensured the students didn't lose a precious year i guess that's a huge service that to me that's patriotism ensuring so many children across the length and breadth of the country irrespective of all challenges when we see educators across the country standing up to the challenge to me this is one of the finest examples of patriotism so i think these are few things that i wanted to mention today and to end uh, before i pass it over to shubhayu i remember one of my netaji's favorite quotes which i think really sums it up very well one individual may die for an idea one individual may die for an idea but that idea will after his death incarnate itself in a thousand lives i guess this really sums up thought process and vision this is a great man i thank all of you for giving me a patient hearing and i really look forward to the deliberation of our esteemed panel today we really have a great panel today and i'm sure that many aspects of this important topic will be deliberated by them and all of us will be enlightened over to you shubhay thank you achin thank you so much for that wonderful presentation uh, we always run a risk when we let achin talk about history because then he gets really passionate and just goes away with it but thank you thank you so much for shedding light on so many different aspects of patriotism Well, ladies and gentlemen, now we have a very, very special guest for you. I have the privilege of introducing to you, Dr. Lieutenant General Retired Monomal Ganguly, VSM. Uh, just to give you a little bit of his background, Dr. Ganguly has always been a brilliant student, from topping all his classes at the IAS exam at his school in Pune. to winning most of the gold medals while topping his final mbbs exam from the prestigious afmc pune both at school as well as college he has been an all rounder representing his house or class or batch in athletics hockey football and afmc in inter college debating and dramatics in addition he set a new record for being mr afmc for best physique for a couple of years in succession thereafter he rendered 40 years of meritorious service in the indian army medical corps where he was a brilliant onco surgeon which is the only one from the armed forces till date to have obtained an mch degree in the subject he has been a professor of surgery and onco surgery for over 30 years at various institutions and universities of india as well as the nams and elected president indian association of surgical oncology he has successfully served as dean of the acms which is the army college of medical sciences delhi cantonment commandant of the prestigious officers training college of the afms where within one year he built a new college operationalized and shifted it chief administrator as ceo and group ceo of various tertiary care hospitals and finally headed the entire medical organization of the indian army as the dgms army his military awards and honors include gocnc cc commendation in 2013 COAS commendation in 2014 the vashish seva medal presidential award in 2015 phs which is president's honorary surgeon in 2019 and he was elected and appointed as i said as colonel commandant of the army medical corps on 27th january 2019 he is a go getter who is known for his vision hard work and drive in implementing his new ideas for which he has won accolades and has been awarded with various military awards and honors during his service as i just told you post retirement from the army 
He is CEO of a multi-speciality hospital at South Mumbai, where in a short while, he has revamped the hospital and won praises from the clientele and management. He and his wife, Meeta, are keen environmentalists who implement all measures to save the environment. Over the last several years, General Ganguly has grown hundreds of trees from the seeds of all the fruits they eat and has been planting them in various stations. For the last 20 years, his wife has been composting all the green waste at home to make manure as well as bioenzymes to be used in lieu of pesticides. As a result, he has been turning wasteland into gardens growing organic vegetables, the latest being in his hospital at Mumbai. In addition, the couple are fond of socializing, traveling, reading, and they enjoy adventure sports. Sir, it is an absolute privilege to have you on this platform. Over to you. Thank you, Achinder. Hello, Shubhayu, thank you very much for the uh, very complimentary introduction. Uh, actually, the two previous speakers have uh, uh, taken away a large part of what I wanted to speak. But I thank you, uh, thank them for making my job easier, perhaps. <laughs> so at the outset, uh, I think the organizers have done a brilliant job of uh, choosing this topic of patriotism on uh, the day when we remember Desh Naik, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bosch. And I think the government has rightly designated as Parakram Day, where I think all of us should be working towards nation building. To uh, come back to what uh, Achin had said about patriotism, I think we have forgotten what the word actually means. We think that just draping the flag or uh, around us or draping us uh, or uh, draping us in the team jersey while supporting the cricket matches are patriotism and rest of the time we can do whatever we feel like uh, which is not in the national interest or does not contribute towards nation building. So coming back to the term itself, it's based, uh, it was first coined in 1500s and it was derived from the Greek word patriotis, which means fellow countrymen or lineage member or rooted in the term fatherland or the English patriarchy. And right now it's a noun that means devoted love, support, and defense of one's country, that is national loyalty. This automatically brings to mind those serving in the armed forces, because we in the armed forces don't think twice about uh, politics or religion or casteism. We just believe in doing what is good for the country and defending the nation's borders from all the invaders. And we have also, the armed forces has always been called in to serve in where civilian rescues, whether it's a child falling into a tube well, whether it's uh, falling landslides, whether it's falling floods. Uh, we have always been springing to the rescue of our fellow citizens. So the uh, loyalty of uh, the armed forces has never been questioned. And that is why I think it is still regarded as uh, in a very high um, sort of um, manner by the rest of the populace. However, as Achin uh, rightly brought out, that this corona pandemic of the last one year has brought to the fore a lot of other uh, patriots who have volunteered their service at the risk of their lives to help us combat the various, uh, uh, various problems which the lockdown brought for us. So those millions who volunteer their free time in the interest of the country or the nation building exercises and show their patriotism by working for the nation are also the patriots. And as I'm told that the teachers and principals of various schools are uh, amongst the majority of the audience, I think the teachers have a big role in being uh, the molders of the future patriots of this country. Mr. Philip Burnett has talked about his school in particular, which I think is a unique model uh, since uh, I know because, because both of my nephews uh, have passed out from uh, Dun school. But I know that the majority of the schools in India do not inculcate that sense of patriotism. 
they are more into uh, at least the elitist schools are more into uh, producing uh, future uh, entrepreneurs or civil uh, people for the civil services or the higher strata of society or encouraging people to uh, go and seek greener pastures abroad as far as the uh, rewinding of history is concerned i have studied in anglican schools in delhi and pune all my life and it was more based upon uh, what has been happening in the last six centuries rather than what has been happening for the last 5000 years in india and instilling that pride in our uh, past history so i think that uh, as teachers in the audience uh, my wife has been a educator for last 24 years and she has been also a science teacher and environmental teacher a principal or a headmistress so uh, we know that how one can mold young minds and if all of us can do it i think we'll have a, a huge uh, pool of patriots who will take this country back to the days of glory just to quote a few uh, words which will show what patriotism actually means henry james says patriotism is like charity it begins at home george bernard shaw said that patriotism is your conviction that your country is superior to all others because you were born in it Henry Beecher said a patriot mind when it sees the nation's flag does not see the flag but the nation itself even Indira Gandhi said that if i die in the service of the nation i would be proud of it because every drop of my blood will contribute to the growth of this nation and make it strong and dynamic and jawaharlal nehru said that citizenship consists of service of the country Achin talked about nationalism because that has become a buzzword today. Nationalism is a kind of excessive, aggressive patriotism, which is the policy or doctrine of asserting the interests of one's own nation, viewed as separate from the interests of other nations or the common interests of all nations. Many fascist regimes have merged the fervor of nationalism with notions of superiority, especially when it comes to ethnicity. as we have seen in germany and recently in the us or the fervor of religion has been done by a couple of religions over the last few centuries these religions profess peace but have put more people to the sword than has ever been done in the thousands of years before that however extreme nationalism is found frowned upon today where we have a multipolar world and we have to live uh, with in harmony with all nations while trying to promote our own national interests as we are all aware india's freedom from colonial rule was one on the struggles and sacrifices of millions of ordinary indians who were patriots who worked for the dream of an independent india at great personal loss and cost since today's generation seems to have forgotten those ideals i think uh, the teachers and principals have a great role in reminding them of the sacrifices of all these indians most of whom are unsung heroes in fact being a bengali i can say the maximum number of uh, freedom fighters were from bengal and this is testified by the fact that if you go to the cellular jail in andamans out of the 20 pillars with names written on it 19 will have the names of the bengalis who were interned there for life in kalapani and many of them lost their life over there so indians uh, our indian freedom fighters have always rewritten the definition of patriotism by exhibiting resilience under pressure and the latest has been our cricket team in australia who have taken blows to their pride to their body uh, slurs from all sections and have yet shown the world that we have such a depth of young indians who can resist all uh, foreign pressures and still come out on top so i think that we need to remind all our students of the strong points of the indian freedom fighters who have left behind a legacy of courage valor and never dies uh, say die spirit 
few of the names we already know of we know about mangal pandey because his life has been documented in a, a hindi movie and he has been rightly given the recognition of instigating on 29th march 1857 uh, the first indian war of independence and he became a martyr to it on 28th april when he was hanged however not everybody knows about aluria sitaram raju who led a band of tribals in the first rampa rebellion in 1922 to 24 and uh, he fought a guerrilla war against the british by mobilizing the gon tribals however unfortunately he was eventually caught and shot vinayak damodar savarkar has come into prominence recently again as a freedom fighter revolutionary politician proponent of liberty poet writer play writer who founded uh, the student societies in england uh, such as abhinav bharat society the free india society and his publication of the rebellion of 19 1857 was banned by the british and he was also arrested in 1910 and jailed for 50 years in cellular jail in andamans where he continued to pen his works describing hindutva and openly expressing hindu nationalism bhagat singh we are all uh, attracted to because he was a young uh, uh, like a lot of other revolutionaries he was one of the young revolutionaries from punjab who threw bombs and leaflets inside the central legislative assembly to protest the death of another freedom fighter lala rajput rai and even after arrest he undertook his 116 days fast demanding equal rights for both british and indian political prisoners for which he was subsequently convicted and hanged mahatma gandhi as the apostle of the non violent movement and satyagraha is well known to everybody in this country since it is uh, netaji subhash chandra bose's uh, remembrance day uh, i think few people know about the interesting anecdote that when he returned from england after clearing the ics exam he had to sit for a written exam for a job and one of the paragraphs for translation was uh, which actually read was indian soldiers are generally dishonest netaji was furious with this and got up from his seat and expressed dissent about answering this or or translating the paragraph the invigilator said if you don't answer the question you will not get the job so netaji said you can keep your job i would rather die of hunger instead of bearing such false allegations against my countrymen he left the exam hall and rest as we know is history where he went on to found the indian national congress unfortunately over the years his memory was sidelined and i'm glad that it has been resurrected again and brought to the permanence right now and one of his famous quotes was men money and material by themselves cannot bring victory or freedom motivation is required which will inspire us to brave deeds and heroes this is uh, this is the sort of thing that we should be teaching our younger generation that motivation for nation building is the most important thing that we can really impart to them i would like to give another example of uh, patriotism in a different way on 15th august 1936 when india was playing in the finals of the olympic hockey uh, tournament in germany in the dressing room the whole team first uh, saluted the indian national congress flag that time there was a flag of uh india in the independence movement and then after went on to play against germany the germans knowing the strength of the indians had uh, watered the whole hockey ground so that the indians in their shoes without spikes kept slipping and only one goal could be scored in the first half so after the half time bhyan chand who was army man and the captain he took off his shoes and thereafter the team played barefoot and they won by eight goals to one and got the gold medal in the 1936 olympics after the match hitler called dhyan chand and asked him in profession when informed that he was a soldier in the indian army hitler offered him a commission in germany and said that he will go and given the rank of field marshal 
However, Dhyan Chand refused, uh, preferring to stay on in the Indian Army, where eventually he was promoted to a major's rank. That is another example of patriotism. Another example I would like to cite from the Army was that after independence, Field Marshal Oshin Kloss was appointed as the Supreme Commander of the whole armed forces for a year. On 1st January 1948, Sir Roy Busher was appointed the CNC of the Indian Army for a year and the government decided to replace him thereafter by an Indian general. The senior most was General Karyapa, that time a brigadier, and he was the natural choice. However, there were other forces at work. Since Sadar Baldev Singh was the defense minister, the junior most of the three senior uh, officers, who was General Nathu Singh, was chosen to supersede General Karyapa and General Sir Rajinder Singh Ji as the first CNC of India with command over the three defense services. However, when this was conveyed to Brigadier Nathu Singh, he politely declined the offer and said that General Karyapa is my senior and a very competent officer and hence he should be the commander in chief. And that is what has happened on 15 January 1949, which is celebrated thereafter as the Army Day. So these are examples where people put uh, their personal interests aside and uh, committed acts or deeds or words to further the national interest. So I would suggest that the teachers and principals in this audience should rather be, you know, teaching our children the various quotes about India, about our history of ancient times, where even uh, where everybody should be quoting, say, John F. Kennedy, who asked, uh, who famously said that, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And teaching about the glory of India, we have had several quotes from those who have come from outside and seen what India is. And I would like to just put on record some of them because these are the sort of quotes that we, I feel that we should be imparting to our uh, children. Walter Scott said, breathe there the man with soul so dead who never to himself has said, this is my own, my native land. And the greatness of our country as quoted by various visionaries of the world. Romain Roland said, if there is one place on the face of earth where all the dreams of living man has found a home from the very earliest days when man began the dream of existence, it is India. Mark Twain said, our most valuable and instructive materials in the history of man are treasured up in India. And we can back this up with several quotes or uh, several examples of the various astronomers, uh, scientists, mathematicians that India has had centuries back. And they have actually given to the world all what, has, what the world is now uh, uh, actually uh, using in the uh, fields of mathematics, science, technology, medicine, everything. Albert Einstein said, we owe a lot to the Indians who taught us how to count without which no worthwhile scientific discovery could ever have been made. Max Muller, the famous German, said, if I was asked under what sky the human mind has most fully developed some of his choicest gifts, has most deeply pondered on the greatest problems of life and has found solutions, I should point to India. Mark Twain said, as far as I am able to judge, nothing has been left undone either by man or nature to make India the most extraordinary country that the sun visits on its rounds. Nothing seems to have been forgotten, nothing overlooked. And who she, the famous Chinese travel said, India conquered and dominated China culturally for 20 centuries without ever having to send a single soldier across the border. So uh, with these sort of examples, I feel that today's youth studying in our schools and colleges need to regain the patriotic feeling in doing whatever is required to make our great nation even greater and regain the glory where we had, uh, which we had a couple of thousand years back, uh, where this land was uh, leading in the fields of science, technology, uh, astronomy, 
inventions, medicine, and every other field, and was referred to as the land of milk and honey, which all explorers sought to discover, and some found and invaded us. Thus, we need to motivate our children and youth to think of the country first in all our thoughts and actions, rather than the cynical need of personal wealth and advancement only. This can take various shapes. I can only suggest a few. We can again go back to our culture to teach, as uh, Mr. Philip Barnett said, uh, Nachin also, that you know the respect for women, the place that women enjoyed in our society thousands of years back, uh, has somehow been lost over the years. And we need to again uh, put women back uh, at the pedestal where they were at the forefront of all decision making and have been uh, rulers like uh, Rani of Jhasi, etc. As, as uh, uh, Shubhayu had mentioned, me and my wife both are environmentalists. And as, uh, as everybody knows, the virus, in fact, has brought to the forefront that these are all caused, uh, all these viruses have jumped from the animals to man because we have uh, degraded the environment. We have pushed them into close contact with us. Um, the global warming has made these viruses which are inactive uh, into active viruses and we didn't have the defenses to guard us against them. So again, we need to go back to conserving nature. That is imperative and everybody has to be taught that. That conservation of water, electricity and all natural resources including especially the trees and plants should be taught to each and every child in all our schools. They have to be taught that just because, say, a section has been provided free electricity doesn't mean that you misuse it at the cost of fellow citizens or the pollution caused by that production of that electricity or use it to pump out excessive groundwater and thus render our soil infertile where in a few years it becomes like a desert. Similarly, they must be taught sustainable development and living. One of the ways would be that each child should be encouraged to plant at least 10 trees every year and look after them till they grow up and become self-sufficient to survive on their own. Because we can see what pollution is doing to us. 19 out of 20 of the most polluted cities in India, uh, in the world, are in India. And trees uh, allow us to combat some of that pollution because they produce oxygen, as everybody knows. And people have, during this virus uh, pandemic have been dying of, uh, of lack of oxygen due to the effects of the virus. In fact, uh, globally, there was oxygen shortage for the patients in the hospitals. Thankfully, in India, we could manage our oxygen supplies. And uh, we also need uh, to tell them about how the trees help us to conserve water in the soil, they attract rain, and they recharge the natural aquifers. All these, if they continue to do these acts, this is also patriotism of the highest order and what is required today. Similarly, uh, they should be encouraged to again st uh, study the STEM subjects, which in America has been uh, given due prominence as any student who's involved in uh, postgraduate studies for STEM will be given a green card or will be allowed to stay on and work over there because they want our Indian brains uh, or even Chinese brains to come and uh, make all the discoveries in science, technology, engineering, medicine for them. So we have to encourage our children to use their brains to set up and work in the finest of labs of India. And this is where private entrepreneurs and the government has to work hand in hand to give the right environment to allow our children to make discoveries in this country. If for the next decade or so, we still need to go abroad to gain uh, knowledge of uh, what is the latest in the fields of technology and medicine, our children should be told time and again that this is, if you, if you go and work permanently in that country, it is a brain drain for this country because it is our education system, it is our taxes, which has funded your education. And hence, I think it is a patriotic duty of all citizens to come back with the knowledge which they have acquired 
and work in this country and help us to again regain the pre uh, predominant position in technology, engineering, science, medicine, everything. Because again, healthcare has uh, risen to a place of prominence where after being neglected for the last, uh, I think, century or so in our country. So uh, I'll, I'll just give my personal example. Uh, uh, both my uh, sisters and my, uh, fam uh, my father had, uh, when I was joining the army, Everybody had gone abroad. They're all doctors. And my father, after serving for 35 years in the army, had gone on to hold a professorship uh, in, uh, abroad. And both my sisters, who are doctors, also had migrated abroad. But uh, everybody was after me also to migrate. But I uh, decided, you know, I will stay on in this country, serve the Indian army, uh, which I thought at that time, 40 years back, was uh, the best way to serve the country. And uh, I have never regretted that decision. I stayed on here and done my bit to treat thousands of patients with cancer. And uh, even now in this hospital of mine, uh, I think I've been at the forefront of uh, uh, making uh, facilities available for the community for treating COVID patients. And uh, I think I have uh, done my bit uh, for the, uh, you know, towards the patriotism, uh, which I have displayed. So similarly, I would again beseech all my uh, teachers and professors in the audience that all of us must work towards teaching, molding the young minds towards our patriotic duty towards this nation. I would give the example since we, are, uh, we have been talking about the riots and all that and the strikes and the latest, of course, uh, we all know what is happening in the borders of Delhi. Uh, one example my uncle gave me when he had uh, gone for uh, training in Germany. Uh, one day, the factory workers decided to go on a strike. So they decided to come an hour early, sit outside the lock gates and display whatever placards and all they had to display and make their protest felt. But the moment the gates opened, all of them marched in to work and all of them did a productive day. And then at the end of it, they went home. So my uncle was aghast. He said, uh, but when you're on strike, I mean, how come you're working? He said, so that person said that the strike is to show our protest. But our, we cannot let the productivity of this German factory suffer because that is going to affect our nation. So the nation comes first. We have registered our protest in a peaceful manner. And now we have done our work for the day so that our nation does not suffer. Similarly, uh, when we talk about nationalism or patriotism, uh, I think it was the Honda factory where uh, after Japan, as we all know, was in the doldrums after uh, the uh, World War II. And uh, they were, uh, Honda was basically a electric motorcycle, uh, not electric, a motorcycle uh, factory. And they were uh, making what was derisively caused, called by the West as you know, wire, uh, uh, motorcycles just bound together, why wire? But they refused to give up and they refused to even import things from America. They said, no, we will do our own innovation. We will do our own research and we will produce the best motorcycles and thereafter cars that the world has ever seen. And thereafter from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, Japanese cars were known the world over for their uh, reliability, their innovations, their style, everything. They took, o took over the whole automobile industry, which was dominated by the Americans and the Germans. So these are the sort of ways that, you know, if you have to protest, you protest, but you don't allow the economy of the country to suffer. That is something that we got to inculcate in our populace today. So I think with these words, uh, I I'd like to take a uh, leaf and I thank the organizers for giving this, the, um, giving me the opportunity to share a few words with all of you. Thank you so much. General Ganguly, sir, this has been an absolute, absolute delight. Thank you so much for making the time. I think on a day like today, this has been the crowning glory of our day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to be a tough act to follow. But we do have a panel discussion after this with two very experienced educators 
who are going to talk about the place of patriotism in our education system. We have with us Dr. Preeti Manekar, who is a trainer, counselor, and founder trustee of Global Child HR. She has 20 years of experience in HR consulting and group training counseling, competency assessment, and competency development. She holds a philosophy of doctorate in competency requirements of interviewers, and she's published paper in the 63rd All India Commerce Conference at Goa 2010 on business education at Crossroads. She has also organized group trainings and camps multiple times for children. She is an approved trainer for corporates and national banks, and she has consulted more than 100 top clients, especially from IT industries, from Mumbai, Pune, and Bangalore for their domestic and overseas operations. She is currently the principal of the Hem Gurukul School, Pune, which is the CBS affiliated school from 2011 till date. Ma'am, thank you so much for being part of this. We also have with us Mr. Neeraj Mohan Puri, who is the principal of the Modern Sandeepani School at Pathankot. He is also the CBSC District Training Coordinator for Pathankot, the founder of the NGO Goal Foundation, which stands for Global Organization of Academic Leaders. He's also the treasurer of the Pathankot Savodaya Complex and the director of academics, innovation, and training at the Sandeepani Educational Trust. He has numerous professional achievements. I'm just going to list a few. He has received letters of gratitude from the Honorable Prime Minister, Narendra Modiji, and Chief Election Commissioner of India. He has also received a certificate of brilliance from the Honorable HRD Minister, uh, my apologies, the erstwhile HRD Minister, Mrs. Smriti Irani. He is a CBS resource person for accountancy in general, and he's been decorated with the Educational Icon Award 2020 by ICSI India, Global Teachers Award 2020 by CED Foundation, Dronacharya Award 2019 by Punch Foundation, and Visionary Leader Award 2018, amongst many others. He's currently pursuing his PhD in management after holding an MBA in finance, an MPhil, an MCOM, an MA in economics, a B.Ed, and a DCA degrees. Sir, privileged to have you with us. I know you have come straight from another webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much for making the time. I'm going to stop my share now. I would request you to please uh, switch on your cameras so that we can start our discussion. Uh, Dr. Monica, thank you so much for being here. If I may come to you first, ma'am. Uh, personally, what does patriotism mean to you? And how do you see it as part of our education system? Patriotism has definitely changed. First of all, before uh, I could start, I would really sincerely thank Notebook team uh, for, uh, I mean, it's my privilege to be here and uh, be a part of such an elite gentry. I heard three people and they were, I mean, uh, they were great, great and great. Okay, they, are, they have done their lifetime job and they are doing. So thank you very much for this. And uh, uh, then I would like to express my gratitude towards this 20, 125th birth anniversary of uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. Okay, and after I mean, after offering tribute, I would like to start now. Uh, see, patriotism, what it was before uh, independence is totally different, and patriotism today, the definition, I think we have to change it. Okay, uh, we feel that the enemy of uh, is present on the border, but sometimes or many times enemy is present within us or around us. So the sense of pride, the sense of responsibility and the sense of devotion, the sense of feeling of offering service to the nation, I think that is patriotism. And it is not only feeling or uh, it is actually doing something. Your eyes should reflect that patriotism, uh, your speech should reflect like um, I recall incident like um, so Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, once he was expelled out of college just because he repelled uh, to his professor for talking something ag uh, against India. So I think that time also, I mean, the same thing should be um, uh, present here also. If somebody is saying something against India or against your school or against your teacher or against your parents, you should have the feeling for that, to stand, stand by to that. So that emotion, intense emotion to do something that is the definition for me as of today uh, for the world is patriotism. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would uh, get across to Mr. Puri now. So thank you once again for being here. Again, personally, your definition or what does patriotism mean to you? 
Uh, I would start with one couplet, if uh, Mr. Roy, you permit me. I'm audible. So, yes, sir, we can hear you loud and clear. Kabhi sanam ko chhod ke to dekh lena. Kabhi sanam ko chhod kar dekh lena. Kabhi shahidon ko yaad kar ke dekh lena. Koi mehboob nahi hai vatan jaisa yaro. Koi mehboob nahi hai vatan jaisa yaro. Desh se kabhi ishq kar ke dekh lena. So, wonderful evening to all the august audience but the organizers it is indeed a pleasure for me to be part of the galaxy of intellectuals and uh, indeed a uh, privilege that notebook has offered to me being a panelist so sir first i must congratulate you for taking such an appropriate topic for discussion at such an appropriate time as madam has said dr preeti and i was uh, listening with the up to the opinions of uh, lieutenant journal i endorse and second their point of view the patriotism meaning has undergone tremendous change patriotism today is not what it was 1947 when it was in 1980s and when it was when rani jhansi first raised the voice with the generation with the centuries the concepts their meaning philosophy and significance undergoes change i myself personally believe that it is not necessary that if i starve till hunger or if i will shed blood on the borders or if suppose i go on satyagraha then only i am a patriot no the patriotism in 21st century has to be looked upon in a different perspective and i agree absolutely agree with dr preeti when she said if i obey with the law of my land if i am honest if i put my duty first and selflessly work for whatever i am allotted to or the chair i do justice with on which i am sitting i am patriot this is brief my point of view about patriotism wonderful sir absolutely wonderful thank you so much so much for that uh dr manekar if i may come to you and this is a question for both of you i'll just have to take turns because the screen can only show one of you at a time that's the simple logistics that we live with uh ma'am we just heard to general ganguly right one of the realities that you as school principals live with is parents coming up to you and say i want my son to become a doctor i want my son to become an engineer and i'm quite sure when they're saying doctor the image in their head is not army medical core right Uh, ma'am how do you inculcate that sense of service for the country in young students all right uh, first and foremost uh, when parents are coming to me and saying that i would like to my i would like my child to be a doctor or an engineer i uh, i would first stop them and say these are your desires and wishes okay so first and foremost don't put the, the, your desires and your wishes or your aspiration as a burden on your kids okay so let them grow free and uh, 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 let them live their life don't impose what you could not do in your life now you will expect your kids to do the same thing for you okay and you will probably say i wanted to be become a doctor and look i couldn't become so i made my son as a doctor so uh, i would like to go a little behind like uh, how i talk to my parents see we culture or we nurture a uh, four types of leadership in our school that is thought leadership action leadership moral leadership and human leadership now in culturing or nurturing these leadership obviously if child is not having any of the talent at least he will become self leader okay what what we mean by leader a person who can solve his own problem and a person who can take independent decision so first and foremost i would like to i mean i always tell my parents don't make them followers 
okay even you are giving them dream and they would follow dreams obviously i mean uh, they are becoming followers okay so let them have their own independent dream you can show them avenues okay they could become pilot they could become a uh, fashion designer they could become a uh, or dna scientist or whatever what you like step technology is going to be something going to be mentioned so they let them know everything and then let them decide what they would like to do and you have a courage to accept what they are and what they would like to be so it is more to parents that they have to accept what child is dreaming and support rather than expecting what parents are dreaming and expect children to follow that okay so this is a change and uh, see it is i mean i uh, we do psychograph of every child twice a year we do intelligence profiling twice a year so lata mangeshkar is a lata mangeshkar by virtue of her musical intelligence einstein is a einstein by virtue of technical his technical logical and personal intelligence all the successful people first they have their personal intelligence in place and whatever treasury god has gifted they they could identify that and they could grow so i would not i would never support uh, any bias from any parents or any pre defined ideas that i would like to make my child like this or like that let him grow as as an uh, how he would like to grow it is what my answer is okay whether he would like to fight with himself and come up with poetry or um, become a writer or he would like to fight with a nation and become a soldier live it to himself and he's traitor right that is my take on this wonderful ma'am uh mr puri if i may come to you next sir yeah so would you please come again what you uh, expect from me i uh, so just is- asking because we all agree that patriotism is, is an important personal value to inculcate given that you're dealing with young children who have still not formed this entire idea of patriotism it's something that they are perhaps carrying different notions in their heads when they're coming to your school from their homes how do you teach them patriotism that's the simple question i guess wonderful sir uh, amazing question uh see first thing we need to understand that leadership is actually a trait and is an acquired behavior most of the time leaders are formed they are made they may have some genetically that some genes in them but most often they are made now great leaders honest and sincere leaders i correlate to them with the great patriots we do have if we talk about uh way back years back now when it comes to that how we can nurture this patriotism in children it is again a process when a children joins us we first of all need to make them have the sense that what patriotism is they may have different notions as we discussed in the beginning different notions they may be carrying when they have seen the patriotic movies when they would have read some biographies of ancient leaders patriots or freedom fighters so no we need to make them distinguish ki yes my dear if you preserve the resources if you save electricity if you save water if your parents are uh, you know paying taxes if you are not involved into any kind of mal practices if you are not corrupt so you are equally a patriot as in my beginning address also i said it is not necessary that unless and until i don't shed my blood then uh, that means i am not a patriot definition is different so if they are means into these activities we are making them equally a patriot and this could be instilled and inculcated to them through their daily activities so we have to do plenty of activities involving the children feeding this moral spiritual civic or social values or the life skills i bring them and treat them at par with the patriotism so there are series of activities which we can do and i appreciate the activities which even ma'am has shared they are doing in their institution to inculcate the spirit of patriotism in students so according to me these are some small steps through various activities by giving them an onus and ownership 
of the responsibility making them accountable for their actions is equally producing the freedom fighters equally producing a great leader Thank wonderful you. sir love that definition of new patriotism uh, again dr manika this is going to be my last question so i'll come to you first uh ma'am over your career as a teacher have you seen a change in the way patriotism as a topic is dealt with by both teachers and students uh definitely when i was in school uh, all the days were celebrated including gandhi jayanti um then uh, subhash chandra bose then uh, nehru ji children's day i mean great people we had day then uh, there was a photograph and then uh, we used to garland that few kids used to give speeches on their life and that was the end of celebration okay it was done as a ritual where i was studying but today i think we are more enlightened probably and uh, more focused and uh, education is um, is an institution so we are really trying to institutionalize what i mean values they have lived on this day we are recharging our own self and getting inspired by their greatness in case if it is a um, 2nd october gandhi jayanti then of course will ask someone to actually drape in that particular um, costume okay to represent how he was how he lived his life then narrate few incident make a skit like how he lived how maybe some few in, uh, episodes from his life okay and a few kids will in that so you know when you see drama when you see somebody standing like a gandhi in front of you so it creates a different impact on your uh, mind and what like today we enjoy freedom between teachers principal and students we exchange uh, feelings opinions thought very freely and in my school days it was even to enter in the principal's cabin i i don't remember till 10th standard i have ever entered in principal's cabin and i see in my cabin i mean there is a group of students coming in okay so i am most of the time surrounded by students so there is definitely a uh, lot of change in how we pursue values over here in my days we used to feel inspired and we used to follow certain thing now we can openly ask look like it is like this if you like uh, gandhi ji gandhian thoughts you follow him if you like bharat bhagat singh thoughts you follow bhagat singh so the freedom is given to student like whom they would like to follow as a role model and uh, what type of um, leadership they would like to pursue whether it is a thought leadership again i'll repeat this or action leadership and how okay so there is a see difference in how we used to celebrate our, and how my teacher used to imbibe patriotism in us and how we are doing okay that's that's my see on this wonderful ma'am thank you thank you so much uh, mr puri sir same question how you have seen patriotism as a concept evolve over time Uh, sir definitely it has changed there is an ocean of difference now mm, mentioned earlier also now mindsets are changing you cannot expect the same kind of patriotic feelings which were uh, way centuries back and now in this generation given the type of lifestyle given the comfort given their raising their upbringing so there are plenty of traits which a patriot displays and it keeps on changing from generation to generation and civilization to civilization the priorities were different when we were under the clutches under the jaws of britishers when we were ruled by aurangzeb when we were ruled by moguls so as we have descended the civilizations become uh, more developed accordingly the priorities have changed so accordingly the concept and the mushrooming nurturing has to change so now it is a high time that we talk about realistic issues challenges that who are our real enemies like terrorism corruption sustainability so uh, better uh, you can say alternative sources so these are contemporary issues they are our terrorism there are our terrorist they are to be uh, counter so accordingly we have to train our young generation our gen z kids that how to combat these monsters so we have to train them 
we have to equip them empower them by engaging them it can be through role plays it can be by uh, making them step into the decision making process by doing an open dialogue with them the way you are sitting and doing a panel discussion with us so the contemporary the realistic the demanding issues can be put and thrown to the children and let them come up with the solution because they are genius they are idea machines and trust me they can uh, give some unthinkable solutions to some of the problems and this is equivalent to a uh, being patriotic in 21st century according to me wonderful sir i think uh, we've had some great views uh, unless both of you want to add something more i would now invite ossin back for the vote of thanks ma'am sir thank you so much for your time with your permission ossin over to you you have a lot to thank for today i think uh, a really great discussion for you undoubtedly so and i think a very motivational as well the way the entire uh, discussion went forward was really really uh, inspired by it but sir as always you really give us a great start and i'm sure all of us including our members of our esteemed audience really inspired by the series that you shared with us undoubtedly the contribution of your school undoubtedly it's something which is really really inspiring and some great aspects also that you dwelled on very thought provoking aspects which i think set the tone for the day Lieutenant General Ganguly, sir, very inspirational. I was I was just going through some of the comments when you were speaking, sir, and I was really happy to see that your deliberation was very very motivational for a lot of our esteemed delegates. Various aspects, you know, the way you give examples from all over the globe, some very motivational quotes. a great to know about the real the way the entire spirit of patriotism and how it influences various aspects even be it industry in japan that you're talking about the mobile sector undoubtedly and i think one of the very important aspects that you highlighted the role of brain drain and the fact that why it is really important really really important to serve our motherland and when i hear when i hear from a lot of people and this debate this is one of the most common debate that goes on you know and i ask and i hear people asking me and discussing the merits and demerits of trying to relocate abroad for for greener pastures there's nothing wrong with it but i remember a quote by president kennedy one of my very favorite quotes when he said ask not what your country can do for you ask not what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country that is really sums it up and puts the debate to rest dr manikar again some some really uh, interesting aspects ma'am you brought forward whether that be in terms of uh, the changing the changing the, the changing and the continuous evolution that we have seen in the concept earlier decades to now role plays institutionalization of education trying to work around core values and how how as a society how as esteemed educators all of you are really working towards it in order to ensure that such values I inculcated among our next generation. Nira sir, again, uh, thank you so much. Especially the way you started off, you yeah. know, great start. I must say, I'm sure everyone here in the audience loved the way you started off with few lines. Very inspiring, and I completely agree with you that today notion of patriotism. 
definitely the far more wider concept that we also discussed at length, especially during last few months of pandemic when we have seen various sections of the society, frontline workers, our esteemed educators stepping up to the challenge. So I remember another one of my uh, very favorite quotes by Adair Stevenson, who was a US political leader and diplomat. He, he in fact helped in founding the United Nations where he served as a chief US delegate. One of his quotes, which really sums it up is, patriotism is not short frenzied outbursts of emotion, but the tranquil and steady dedication of a lifetime. So I think uh, really, really, really uh, great deliberation we had. And I also believe that patriotism consists in not only waving the flag, but in striving that our country shall be righteous as well as strong. This was said by, I guess, James Bryce, British politician and diplomat. So I think we really had a great session. I thank all members of our esteemed audience for being with us here today evening. Your constant support and encouragement has helped all of us at Notebook to ensure that Together for Education as a platform grows from strength to strength. We look forward to your cont continuous patronage in the days to come. Thank you, take care and goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, Achin. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Pleasure is all of us. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Thank you to the entire sir. team of Notebook Thank and all the August participants. It was indeed a clear. Thank you, dear sir. Thank you. And thank you, Pritima. Thank you. Good night.